the phenomenon that we're going to talk about today, thanks to the kindness of its founder, who is willing to visit with us, something called couch surfing. So um, with that, we're going to start a discussion with Dan Hoffert uh, and get a little groundwork laid for how couch surfing began. Uh, I guess we should pull our audience. We can't do this easily with the webcast uh, watchers, but for the people in this room, how many uh, have used couchsurfing.com before? So how many are using it right now in the sense of staying in Boston with a host? Excellent. Oh, no. Oh, no. You're just, ah, you are hosting people right now. Got it. Not at this very moment. Last couple of days. That works for me. Um, great. Uh, is there anybody here heard of couch surfing? Or is our audience, aha, Professor Zinberg. Uh, so good. That gives us reason to do I'm some exposition. Today. Exactly. <laughs> Focus group of one. So Dan, um, first tell us a little bit about your background. If we knew you as a teenager, what would we see? <laughs> well, um, so, my, so my name is Daniel Hoffer. I'm, I'm founder and chairman of Couchsurfing. Um, my background, as a teenager, I founded a online community. Uh, I am 31 years old, so uh, as a teenager, I was working on a project um, on a bulletin board system uh, back in the early 90s and founded a uh, online community that connected physically disabled um, uh, patients, people with muscular dystrophy, with uh, elementary and high school students online. And this was, a, when you say online then, if this was early 1990s, this was not internet. Yeah. It, well, this, this was internet, but this was pre-web. Pre-web internet. Yeah. So how did they connect? They used Gopher or something? Uh, well, they, they used, uh, they dialed up to an online uh, bulletin board system through yes. the modem. Yes. Um, and there, it was, there was an internet hookup using uh, FidoNet. Back in FidoNet? The, yeah, I don't know if you remember. Anybody remember FidoNet? <laughs> yeah. Ah, Chris Segoyan, of course. <laughs> FidoNet. That was where bulletin boards at individual phones could call each other on the phone yeah. in the dark of night and swap messages exactly. with one another. Yeah. Yeah. And if you had a wrong number in the FidoNet list, it would just keep calling it and it would be a human <laughs> answering, saying, shut up already, I don't want your loud screeching noises. Right. 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 Yeah. It was, Good it was, times. It was a pretty crappy system, it, it, yes. you know, but it kind of worked. It worked just well enough to give you hope that it could work. And what, first, what first got you into this? Um, you know, I, I got into uh, online stuff in elementary school. I, I was really bored. In I, I grew up in Brookline. And, uh, <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot goes on in Brookline. Um, more now, I think. I think the town's got more exciting. But uh, no, it, it was kind of a, a quiet little town. And so you turned to computers to ease the boredom. Well, you, you know how you get the stereotypical 13-year-old, and like you know, in in their real life, they're they're a 13-year-old, and online they're like. Master of the Universe, you know, or like, or like Dark Lord or something. So that, that you know, that was me. Uh -huh. yeah. So I had my whole alter alter identity online. And, and um, how did that project turn out? That, um, that was great. You know, it was it, because it was so early. It was kind of innovative. So yes. Um, so it was pu uh, publicized on the front page of the Globe, um, and you know, lined up a bunch of schools around that. It's really place. news perfect, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Young teen <laughs> helps the disabled using computers. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it was, uh, it was a good start. That was back in like 92. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just kind of okay. from there. <laughs> so you go to college. Yeah, so I, w I went here. Harvard College. Harvard College. You can hear the cheers if you're on the webcast. People are <laughs> cheering wildly right now. Um, and you majored in? Uh, philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah. Deep thoughts about unemployment. And, you know. <laughs> Got it. And uh, while you were in, while, while you were in college, were you? Uh... Yeah. So in college, I um, uh, I, I ran a, a software consulting firm out of my dorm room. Um, partnered with uh, you know local companies, uh, Next Step Technologies, and other other local firms. Um, I see Next Step is represented here today. <laughs> Very good to see you. Yes, Ms. Chadnafti. Um, yes. And uh, you know, uh, had had a bunch of clients, um, and then started to leverage that towards towards founding a dot com, raised uh, a couple million in, in venture capital. Uh, was was still a student at the time, so I took some time off. Um, and what was the dot com called? Dot com was called Fuxido Worldwide. It was a uh, easy to spell. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was a, based on uh, some Spanish word. It was a soccer website, so our target market was in Latin America. Um, so we figured we needed some Spanish words to, to reach the uh, 
the customers. And how did that turn out? Um, you know, it crashed ultimately. Uh, um, Raised a couple million. I was when like, you first it was it was Spanish uh, soccer. You say so, yeah, yeah. Soccer when you got website. when you got your first tranche of money, were you like go? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I had much. Um, yeah, so actually, we had we had Seamus Malin, who's uh, the local MLS commentator. He was working for us. Um, he was also affiliated with Harvard, actually. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, learned a lot. But at 22, I didn't really know anything about running a business. Okay. Uh, so out of the ashes of that, what happens next? Yeah. So then I, I hired a team for that company and ended up hiring the people who later became my co-founders uh, for Couchsurfing. Um, so my VP of technology and, and also usability, um, you know, ended up, we became friends and, and we ended up co-founding uh, co Couchsurfing later. When did you get the idea? Um, so the idea was, uh, so I had done a lot of adventure travel, um, but the idea was actually kind of, my idea kind of also the genesis of my partner, uh, Casey. Define adventure travel for those who are not adventurous. Yeah, so, so after college I, I graduated, I spent a few months traveling through Southeast Asia, um, and I was, uh, you know, by myself and traveling through Bali and made friends with uh, local people in Bali and, and ended up staying with them and, at their homes and, you know, staying up late and drinking beer and playing chess and, and just having a totally different experience than you would get if you stayed at a Marriott, um, you know. So, so that kind of tuned me into, and I, and I also done things like that in, uh, in college. I, I took some time off. I, I wasn't the typical Harvard student. I, I went and worked on a ranch in Texas one semester in college. I had trouble getting through Harvard. Um, made it eventually, but, but uh, two detours along the way. Um, so I, I worked on a ranch and, and uh, you know, couch surf there, uh, which was also a very different experience. You know, just getting to see a different kind of person and people and culture. So I guess uh, it would be helpful to define the term. What is it to couch surf? Yeah, so to couch surf, um, uh, to couch surf is, well, so, so we've actually expanded, we, we tried to expand the definition of the term a little bit. Um, you know, they, in, in common parlance, it, it means to stay in someone's home and sleep on their couch. Um, Generally, someone you don't know otherwise. Well, I mean, it, you know, traditionally it's been someone you do know. We've, we've kind of expanded this to the people you don't know. Uh, that's kind of the core value proposition. Um, but, yeah, you know, uh, we also encourage couch surfing to be not just limited to staying on people's couches uh, on an overnight basis, but also if you're traveling, you want to make friends somewhere. Um, maybe you already have a place to stay, but you just want to see the scene, you want to get to know local folks. Um, Couchsurfing, by our definition, still perfectly valid to reach out to people and, and meet up with them for a cup of coffee um, or you know, go out for a beer or go to a nightclub with them or whatever um, you know, while you're traveling. So your initial conception for the site yeah, was so, what? So, um, so, so I was inspired based on my successful experiences couchsurfing in Texas and, and in Bali and so on. And the way you basically do that is you would meet people at a cafe or at a restaurant or something. Yeah, just you'd greet them, they'd greet you, yeah. and they'd say, where are you staying tonight? And you'd say, I'm glad you asked because yeah, I got much, nothing. Much, yeah. And then they'd be, why don't you stay with us? Something like that, yeah. And then you'd do something in exchange. Yeah, so, you know, in, in Bali, you know, I, I would... Uh, um, I mean, they, Bali is not a terribly wealthy area. It's part of Indonesia, um, and you know, so I, I try to bring big bottles of beer for us to drink as we were staying up late. Uh, my contribution, they made me a feast, and so on. I'm obviously thinking of a specific experience, um, but but the idea uh, for the website came from my partner um, Casey, and, and he was taking a trip to Iceland, uh, wanted a place to stay, was traveling on a budget. Um, and ended up finding a uh, mailing list of university students from Reykjavik. Um, it's basically spamming, completely inappropriate. He, he spammed Where is Reykjavik? Reykjavik, yeah. Iceland. Okay. <laughs> um, he, uh, he Somebody says, what's the capital of Iceland? And the answer is about two kroner right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to date the webcast. Yeah. <laughs> be one crumb next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so, so he spams a list he inappropriately. List. He, he sent out an email to the entire list of kind of like a thousand students, none of whom he knew, obviously, saying, hey, I'm an American coming to Iceland. Uh, <laughs> they said, we know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's like, you know, any chance I can stay with someone? Um, and a bunch of people responded, he said, and they said, yeah, you know, come, come stay with me. So he did. Um, had a great experience uh, meeting some locals, staying with them, and, and from that, 
uh, we decided, hey, we should institutionalize this. We should make it easy for other people to have the positive experiences with uh, uh, staying and, and spending time with locals that we've had. So at that point, was this sort of a back burner project, or this was like, let's do it full time. We're going to build this site and roll it out. Yeah, it started out as, as back burner. You know, he, yep. um, my partner was working on a political campaign. I was working as a management consultant, um, and so this was kind of back burner for both of us. And then uh, my, my partner is, is a programmer, so um, you know, this site certainly benefited from programming because that's what it is. Uh, so he um, started to wean himself off of full time work in order to dedicate more and more uh, um, time to, to building the site. And when you conceived of it, was it as a money-making uh, proposition or yes? Yeah, so so CapturePing is, is a nonprofit, um, and it's something we've, we've always gotten a lot of questions about. Um, but but the idea was, uh, you know, partially the idea was so that when we traveled, we could have more people to stay with and, and have fun with. Do you block the Wayback Machine from CapturePing.com? Um, yes, I don't know. Say what? Do you have a spider on it, possibly? Well, the, the, the question is, I, it, yeah. it may be, it, it's funny that it has no, I was going to look for the old couch surfing, the oldest possible homepage, yeah. but it looks like the Wayback Machine has been instructed not to, anyway, we digress. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you were saying. Um, yeah, so, so couch surfing is a nonprofit, and, and the idea was that, you know, uh, just from a personal, selfish level, we, want, we wanted more people to stay with when we were traveling, because um, it would be more fun if you can find people everywhere. Um, but we... Uh, um, we decided to, to open it up and, and enable other people to have great experiences, and, and money was not really the, the primary um, motive. Uh, so, so we, we made it a nonprofit. We, we thought that, that would um, influence the, the feeling of the site, you know, the culture, which I, I definitely think it has. Um, and you know, to this day, we're, we're still a nonprofit. So, how did you unveil it? Um, so, there it is. Um, this is our new logo, by the way. You know, it's funny. This is a small digression, but you know, you always running a business. There are always things you never think of. You know, and we, we just did this new logo up here, and, and then you know, the people in Asia, our members in Asia, we have hundreds of thousands of members in Asia. They, we, they, we started getting this hate mail saying, you know, why are you discriminating against Asia? You know, we're important too because you know you're not showing Asia in your logo. There's only was this so the old? This was the old logo. No. Oh. No, that was one of the... <laughs> that's a competitor that's ripped off your name. Yeah, no, that, that was one of the t-shirt designs. I see. Um, anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I totally forgot the question. <laughs> I got distracted by my own name. How did you, how did you unveil it? <laughs> oh, how did we unveil it? Right. Yeah, so the go-to-market approach was uh, um, we, we posted on... Uh, uh, we basically did guerrilla marketing. We've never paid for marketing at all of any kind. Um, and we posted on uh, tribe.net. Um, which was a little more prominent uh, you know, five or six years ago than it is today. Um, but basically, we, we just you know sent out emails to a bunch of news groups and you know, Newsnet and, and uh, saying you know hey we've got this new site check it out. Um, what did the adoption curve look like? Uh, so actually, if you click more statistics, let's see the adoption curve. So. Uh, uh, go go up and go, go to real regional stats. Scroll down. All the way, all the way to the bottom. Okay. All right, there's there's the adoption curve. <laughs> uh huh. And then this is this is cumulative, and this is weekly. Uh huh. See every now and then there's a spike from some uh, particularly prominent. So there was a period of time, say from here to here, yeah, where you were just like. Waiting for the ship to come in. Well, I mean, honestly, you know, back in the day, you know, we, we get we get something like two thousand members every day now. Um, when this started, we were so excited to get like two members. You know, it was awesome, and, and I used to go and, and read every single new member coming in, you know, look at their profile, and kind of you know, learn about them. It was very exciting. It's like Tom um, friending you on MySpace. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I didn't I didn't friend everyone, but but I definitely looked at the profile. And, you know, it was, uh, you could call it customer research, but it was really just because I was excited someone was visiting the site. Um, so it, it didn't feel like slow growth. Got it. I mean, it, also in part because we weren't backed by venture capitalists. We weren't, you know, uh, performing to specific, to specific milestones or, you know, target metrics. This was completely bootstrapped. So, 
um, it didn't really matter how fast it grew. And the original functionality of the site was user registration, declare where you'd like to stay or declare where you are and who you'd like to host and then kind of almost an eBay-like engine that just puts the two together. Pretty much. I mean, the, the core functionality hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, the core is the same, and we've made things more robust. Um, we've built out features. We've, we've had to invest a lot in scalability of the site because uh, we now get so much traffic. You know, so our technology team is always just you know dealing with uh, the, grow the growing pains associated with the scalability um, and the growth. So, and uh, when was your first sense, if ever, that? Simply arranging for people to get together and calling it a day as far as the site was concerned was not enough to keep the community thriving. And again, it might be a loaded question. Maybe that is enough. Uh, well, I'm, I'm curious why you're saying it's not enough. Well, I guess I've talked about couch surfing to audiences which include almost no couch surfers, and there's still plenty of those, as you might guess. Yeah. And when I describe it, I say it usually a little playfully as, at last, a site that connects people who want to sleep on a faraway stranger's couch for free <laughs> with people who live far away and would like a stranger to sleep on their couch for free. There you go. And often, my sense is that when people hear about it, they say, well, geez, how many people have been robbed or hurt using couch surfing? Kind of a classic Fox 25 News at 10 kind of question. Sure. Um, exactly the kind of phenomenon by which Fox 25 or other local news, don't mean to single out Fox, would lionize this as a really cool thing. Right. And then the minute there's a problem, just like we have the Craigslist killer, right. you, know, you never call it the newspaper killer if somebody right. used a newspaper ad to yeah. get to somebody. Then suddenly it's, uh-oh, what are the dangers? So yeah. is there that moment where if somebody says, or you're even looking, I had a bad experience, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want this person to host or to surf on your couch again, that right. you figured the system ought to somehow be responding to that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, couch surfing, so it's kind of a long and complex answer to that. Um, so rein me in if I start talking okay. too much. Um, couch surfing is based on a mentality of idealism and, and faith in others. You know, so, the first, so typically when I tell people about couch surfing, the first, um, in many cases, the first reaction I get is, what an awesome idea. And the second reaction I get, which happens about one second later, is, is it safe? Um, so, and, and especially from women. Um, so safety is, is a top concern, and, and we're, uh, we're certainly very sensitive to it. Um, you know, uh, basically, we, we have facilitated uh, approximately 2 million positive experiences through the site. Um, and, and that's what attracts people. The, the media is a, a fickle animal. Um, and you know, one day they'll sing your praises and the next they'll turn on you. Um, we've been fortunate that they have um, by far sung our praises much more than anything negative. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there is the concern. I mean, we, you know, there's never, there have never been any murders through the site, thank God. Um, you know, knock on wood, right? Um, and, and that's the risk. You know, and we have, uh, you know, I, I, I work, we have a whole PR team now because we, we actually receive a ton of media coverage. Um, I've worked with my PR team and, and uh, you know, helped, helped put a plan in place for, you know, how do we deal with incidents like that? Um, you know, how do we deal with if, if the press gets a hold of it? You know, they, everyone's looking for a story, you know, and if they get, if they hear about something juicy and someone gets hurt or killed or whatever, you know, they're going to love to broadcast that as loudly as they can because it's a good story. Um, so, you know, so we, we have a PR team that's now trained at dealing with that and, and uh, you know, we've been um, practicing procedures and so on. Um, but all this stuff that you go on the site when, as you say, question three on the fact is, is it safe? Okay. There's all now sort of extra features. When do these features come along that members can vouch for each other, that you can be designated an ambassador, or that you've been verified to different levels? That starts to sound 24-like. Maybe just explain these quickly, and then yeah. how did they come about, yeah. and when? Yeah. So you know, so we, we, we've thought, um, I mean, obviously, in any startup is a progression, right? You're always, and even if it's not a startup, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi iterate on their model every day. Um, so we're, we're always iterating on trying to figure out how to make uh, everything more effective and more successful. Um, so 
some of these things didn't exist initially. We have a, a number of systems in place to help address safety concerns and to make the site safer and to make the community safer. Um, so one of those, if, if anyone has used eBay, you know, there's a seller, uh, um, you know, reference system and, and people rate sellers, right? So we have a system like that. You rate the couches that you've stayed on. Uh, you write references. You actually write text about the people that you've stayed with. And is, are these easily found or just want to have to log in to find it? No, you can find any, any member is visible. So if you go to the homepage uh -huh. and click on a photo of a member, um, yeah, just click show. Let's scroll down. Yeah, there you go. So, so these are these are references. This person has uh, a couple references. There you go. Charismatic and fun, and uh, good with people. Pets, no. <laughs> so you know, this is the kind of thing people write about each other, and they, they characterize the experience as positive, um, positive, neutral, or negative. Uh, we used to have extremely positive, positive, neutral, negative, and extremely negative. Um, if anybody got rated short of extremely positive, they're like, what was wrong? What did I do? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, what, what I found interesting is some of the, um, the different ways culturally that people react to each other. So in Latin America, people tended to rate uh, more positively overall, um, which is kind of interesting. And then, you know, other cultures, uh, people were especially afraid to rate negative, um, you know, kind of where they're more sensitive about saving things and so on. Um, so you know, one of the things we've, we've had to think about is what kind of system really captures this in a way that is universally understood, um, but also is not too granular in a way that's kind of confusing, or there's also the risk of people getting offended by, um, you know, if someone gets rated positive and instead of extremely positive, you know, you get your feelings hurt a little bit. Uh, you know, like, what could I have done to be extremely positive? That kind of thing. Are we taking questions? Sure. Chris. So what you've described here is essentially is a reputation system, yeah. which is similar to eBay's, right? And yeah. one of the, the, I guess, the problems that eBay's system has suffered from, first is that you can go on and, and basically transact with yourself and give yourself positive feedback. To go and feedback out. farm. Yeah. Feedback farm. your five closest friends or alter egos. Right. Right. So I could go, I could create a bunch of fake accounts and give positive feedback to someone, and then you sell something for $10,000 and then never deliver the good, right? So you, yeah. you have the possibility of that. And then, you know, reputation networks in general, only are as good as the, the cost of, of creating a new account, right? If you, the minute you have any sort of negative feedback, you ditch that account and create a new one. Yeah. How have you uh, mitigated those those issues in your system? Yeah, so so you raise an excellent point, and um, it, so so that's that's a great segue into another one of our uh, systems that we have in place and, and operational processes. So so we also have an identity verification system, um, and that helps authenticate that people are who they say they are. So you know the risk is that I can create five accounts in Couchsurfing under five different names, and I can leave myself five different references, all extremely positive, um, and and fool the world, right? So that that's a risk. Um, the way we partially mitigate that risk is through our identity verification system. What we do is we t we use uh, credit card information um, and and sometimes passport information to uh, to verify that the people are. The people live where they say they live. Um, so we send a postcard with a proprietary code to someone's address based on their credit card information, um, and then they need to punch that code into the website, and then we know that they live where they say they live. It's not foolproof. Um, and ultimately, something we emphasize is that this system can be gamed. This is not perfect. Um, you know, you never, you, you can't know for sure. So if anyone says, can you guarantee that Couchsurfing is safe? I say, absolutely not. There is no guarantee like that at all. Um, that said, um, what we have works. Um, well over 99% of experience, like I said, 2 million positive experiences. Um, so we one of the more experienced couch surfers, and it seems like we have a number of couch surfers in the room, which is great, um, I think become experienced at reading profiles and actually being able to, you know, they, they increase their ability to spot um, any potential issues. And, and it is possible to get a sense of someone from their profile and also based on comments. You know, if, if all the references have the same writing style or the same punctuation style or typos or whatever, um, you know, you, you can start to get a sense of, of these things. Um, and also by looking at the references themselves. You know, I, I, you know if I, if I um, leave a reference for someone and then someone's checking that person out and they, they link back to my reference, they see I'm a founder, 
um, they say, oh, okay, well, you know, if, if Dan's providing reference, then in, that means he's met them. Um, probably not. You know, probably going to be okay. Uh, so you know, you, you get to you get to see people. You also uh, Couchsurfing also tracks kind of like LinkedIn um, who you're connected to inside the site. Uh, so you can see which of your friends might know someone you're going to stay with, or how many layers away um, someone is. So so th there's no one system that makes it perfect. Um, but in aggregate, we have multiple ways of addressing this challenge that, that combine and make the system work uh, pretty well. What percentage of the feedback left is negative? Um, so that's actually tracked. Uh, if you go on to, uh, uh, if you go back to the mission statistics page, um, go back to the homepage and click, uh, click statistics. Uh, statistics. Go down. Scroll down. Sorry. Under about. Under about. Or left. Okay, that works. Mission, okay. So that's regional statistics. There's also mission statistics. Uh -huh. um, yeah, 99.806%. Okay. Pretty good. How big a customer service operation do you run? Are people sometimes contact you, somebody left a negative thing uh -huh. and verklempt over it, what, you know, how can I have it expunged? How can I tell my side of the story sort of thing? Or Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I get the most ridiculous emails sometimes. Um, I get these like, I get these like three-page emails from random people in random countries, you know, saying, you know, the, my, my neighbor was on the site and then, um, you know, they, there was a girl and, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a, a dinner and, and um, someone knocked over the candle, and then they, the curtain caught on fire, and, you know, and, and all this stuff. And bottom line, they left me a reference, and my profile got deleted by the safety team or something. And can you please restore it? Because clearly, I deserve to be here. Um, I, I get this all the time. Uh, and we, your answer to that is the answer is <laughs> yeah. The answer is no. <laughs> okay. And there's a safety team. There's a safety team. Are so. they employed? Are they paid? Yeah. So so we have. Um, so one of our, our core really valuable teams is we have uh, it's called the Member Dispute and Safety Team, MDST. Um, and we have uh, a woman named Rachel DeServo um, leads that. She is a full-time employee of Couchsurfing. Uh, she has also recruited a, a volunteer staff to help her. Very selective in recruiting. It's, it's a very delicate position. Um, but basically, these 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 complaints come in, you know, member disputes, and, and then um, you know the occasional safety issue uh, comes up, and, and it all goes to her team, um, and they review it, and then depending on the situation, um, may or may not take action. And some of those actions, uh, you know, they do delete accounts in, in certain instances. Um, you know, unfortunately, in very rare instances, there is something like a theft. Um, and that unfortunately has happened. You know, like as you can see, 99.8 percent. It's extremely rare, um, but it has been known to happen. You know, like an iPod was uh, stolen at one point, or you know, something like that. Um, and in that instance, uh, we will that kind of thing. We will work with the police, um, and we'll take our cues from uh, from the cops or the FBI or whatever um, to do whatever needs to be done. What's your biggest worry about the site right now, about the project? Um, so, you know, what I hope is, is we have this fantastic community right now. We, we, a couple weeks ago, we passed the 1 million member mark, uh, which was a big milestone for us. Very exciting. Um, and the thing is, you know, we're growing from a small town to a mid-sized town or a city, depending how you look at it. Um, there's a risk that, that the culture changes and, and, you know, you start to get the wrong sorts of people. So on the one hand, you want to, we want to open this up and make it more accessible and more available and more useful on a global scale. Um, but on the other hand, we don't. We, we want to keep the, the right type of people involved, and we want to keep the special culture that we've had that has enabled us to grow as big as we are today. Um, so basically, growing in a way that's that's sustainable and positive. So is it fair to say that couchsurfing is something to which one apprentices? You kind of encounter the site and sign up, but there's a. There's a runway of sorts, a series of quests almost, if it were a video game, but uh, ways that you sort of get to know the culture of the site as well as just the functionality. Uh, I mean, I guess people might mistakenly confuse it with something like Expedia or TripAdvisor, where it's just you go in and you get linked and 
uh, yeah. go to a hotel kind of thing. Well, your, your use of the word apprentice is, is interesting to me. Um, not surprising you're thinking in these terms, given that you're a professor here. Um, but one of the... Uh, it's either a compliment or an insult. I don't know which. <laughs> compliment, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'd have to leave right now. <laughs> um, no, I, one of the philosophies of couchsurfing, it, it's a very egalitarian kind of mentality. And in, the, in each member profile, we have a field um, called Teach, Learn, Share. And, and the idea is that you know, no matter who you are or where you're coming from, um, everyone has something to teach. Um, even if it's just their own interesting life story, you know, a, a farmer in Cambodia, um, I guarantee you, will, will uh, be better at growing rice than, than you. Um, so, and you guys probably know a whole lot more about law than a farmer in Cambodia, right? So, um, you know, and I experienced this firsthand in, when I was living on a ranch in Texas. You know, they, they had me do ranch work, and I was a Harvard undergrad. Um, I didn't know squat about ranch work. Uh, I kind of sucked at it. But anyway, um, so, so teach, learn, share. Uh, do you see it there? I'm looking for it. I don't see it, actually, in this it, particular. Way. Someone might not have filled it out in their profile, so just go to a different profile. You should see it. You can go to my profile if you want. Well, I'm sure yours would have it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, so the idea of apprenticeship, going back to uh, Jonathan's word there, um, I mean, it, it, the idea is the teacher is the student, and vice versa. You know, it, it, you're always learning from other people in the community, and we encourage that. Um, and it's, it's more of a, you know, you're both the teacher and you're the student, and you're sharing yourself and your culture. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, the profile's not cooperating. I haven't seen it yet, but... Still plenty yeah. going on. Well, there are a million more members, so I'm sure it's. it's <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, question on the uh, online tool: uh, Have you thought about leveraging this to things like carpooling or other social interactions? It's funny that I guess if you want to share a ride, you go to Craigslist. Mm -hmm. It's a much thinner veneer. Yeah. So we actually looked at the carpool market starting in 2002 or something. So we we actually registered a domain back then. Uh, I don't even remember what it was. It's some ridesharing.com or, or one of, some domain that sounded like that. I can tell you one that's taken is carsurfing.com because I wanted to do it. How about <laughs> Zipcar? Yeah. Well, this is Zipcar. This is Robin Chase, founder of Zipcar. Right oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <don't mind. laughs> Natural linkages here, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so certainly there, there are some... some uh, so some great potential there, kind of some obvious synergies. Um, it could maybe, be a bundle deal. You use a zip card to go to your couch surf, and it's, I don't know, bundle so, so, I, so I, I, I believe that Zipcar recently announced, uh, I think today announced a, an alliance around carpooling and ride sharing. Um, it, it's something that we've looked at in the past. We ultimately decided we didn't have the resources to dedicate to it, and we wanted to focus on our core competence. Um, definitely seemed like an inter interesting adjacent market. Um, but not something we have the resources to pursue. And are you at the size where the, uh, this is another online question, the hospitality industry, whether the hostel ends of things, or uh, TEL, uh, or the you know, nicer hotel sides of things, see you as a threat or something to which they have to respond in some way? Bed and breakfast would be natural. Bed and breakfast? And breakfast? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if anyone's read uh, The Innovator's Dilemma by an HBS professor, Kyle Christensen, you know, we're, we're kind of the, the upstart that, that catches the industry by surprise after it's too late for them to do anything about it. Um, no, I, I think ultimately we're, we're, on the one hand, we're making a dent because we've facilitated roughly two million experiences that directly cannibalize sales um, of the hospitality industry. On the other hand, two million is really not that many in the scheme of the global hospitality industry, and it's, you know, we're completely geographically dispersed, so I, I don't think we're we're hurting anyone too much right now. Um, but I think what is interesting is we have helped create this market and that the market is, is expanding. And to the extent that we can change how people actually think about travel, um, that, could rep that could represent a, um, a snow, that could have a snowballing effect uh, that would also extend to other, you know, some of our competitors, frankly, as well, um, that in aggregate 
might start to have an impact on it. Because what you get from a hotel when you stay there is a fee for service. Often what they give you is privacy and isolation, yeah. not a social experience. Right. So yeah. ultimately, there there will always be a niche for hotels or, right. or a niche for us, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know, <laughs> Um, but, but the thing is, you know, for, for business travelers, for example, you know, business travelers should, should not couch surf, in my opinion. Um, I've, I've done my, my share of business travel at, at Fortune 500 companies, and, and it's just hard to develop the relationships with the hosts that we encourage um, because you're too busy doing business. You know, we're nice to meet you. What's your Wi Fi key? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you're there on business, you just don't have time. Um, and and we, we try to de-emphasize uh, a transactional relationship. You know, it's not about free accommodations. It's about developing relationships with people. Um, so so there will always be room for, for uh, you know, hotels will always have a place. Uh, I think we will always have a place. Um, bed and breakfast, as, as you noted, I think would be the most likely to be uh, potentially cannibalized by this, as well as youth hostels. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and, and that's certainly already happening on the youth hostel side um, more than any other uh, segment of, of the hospitality industry. Questions? Um, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. But going back to your, because uh, I saw your hand uh, going back to uh, your earlier statements about the, the future of the web and whatnot, which I kind of found pretty interesting, um, the core value proposition, can you expand on that at all? Of couch um, of, couch, of In general, what is the core value proposition? Of couch -serving. Yeah, yeah, and I guess you can apply it to ghost serving. Yeah, yeah. Is that a term that you apply in marketing in general, or is that a term that is specific to ghost serving? Um, uh, so, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a business guy, so I, I yeah. talk in terms yeah. of value propositions. I guess. Um, I mean, core, yeah, core <laughs> value propositions. That the, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah, so it, from a couch-tripping perspective, uh, you know, I, I see the opportunity, the, 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 the core value proposition to be um, being able to meet uh, new people and develop relationships with people um, that you would not otherwise have, have the opportunity to meet. I suppose another uh, business-type question would be revenue model? Sure. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question? Or, uh, um, no, but... Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Revenue model? Anybody sat on it? <laughs> um, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Cool. Um, Revenue model. Uh, so we, we charge for, so we do not run advertisements. Um, that's certainly, a lot of people assume we run advertisements. Even the press writes articles about us and talks about our advertisements. We don't run advertisements. <laughs> um, so we, we charge for identity verifications. Um, which is a process I described to you a bit earlier. As you know, it, it's uh, um, you know not a foolproof process, but it, it is how we make money. Um, it's optional. Members don't have to do it. Um, only roughly 10% of our members have actually gone through it. Um, but we make enough from that that we're actually profitable as an organization. And that's technically a donation. Um, depending on how you look at it, yeah. Well, the, how your website seems to look at it is <laughs> donations, including verifications. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. So uh, almost 800k. Yeah. 800k. Right? Yeah. So you is know. There a breakdown between donations. Are, are people donating without? Donate now. Do people donate now? Um, so I did the analysis a couple of years ago, and it was 83% um, verification revenue, 70% donation. I suspect it's even higher verification right now. Um, so for the most part, people uh, get verified and, and see that as their donation. In the same way that if you contribute to the World, <laughs> World Wildlife Fund, you know you want your little sticker of the whale or whatever, the polar bear or something, um, panda. So you know, so they donate to us and then they get verified. And that tends to be how it works. Uh, but you know, if our if if we were more financially motivated than we are, obviously there's a lot of things we could do. We could start running ads. We could raise our prices. You know, there are a number of things we could do. Uh, we're in talks with Intel right now to do a sponsorship. We might do it. Um, you know, but but we're uh, um, T-Mobile recently did a, a campaign about us about couch surfing. Um, so I mean, you know, there's money out there. Uh, right now, we're profitable as it is. We're 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 doing uh, we're doing pretty well, and so it hasn't been our primary concern. Yes, sir. A um, couple questions. One, along the lines of competition, have you looked uh, into the to getting into the market of I don't know what exactly what it's called house swapping? Um, uh, and the other question would just be, have you tapped in at all into the the slow travel movement? Um, mm -hmm. 
Sure. So in terms of house swapping, couch surfing, you know, the, the core value proposition of couch surfing is facilitating relationships and, and also by extension facilitating intercultural understanding. Um, so house swapping doesn't really achieve that because you're you don't meet. Um, so so that has not been uh, a, as of much interest. Um, slow travel is, is great. I mean certainly a number of our members live it. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure what role exactly we would play in uh, encouraging that, but we're you know we support it in principle. Way in the back. <laughs> Percentage? In terms on an individual basis. So, given the egalitarian nature of the site, I'm just curious if the donation, if they don't pay for verification, they would give a higher donation. Yeah, um, yeah. In many cases, our donations are of a higher average amount than than what the uh, comparable verification amount would be. Um, it, it, the number cr crunching actually gets a little bit complicated because our our average price, our, our prices change by country. Um, you know, what it costs a different amount to get verified in the U.S. than it does in Thailand, and that's not because it costs us different. It actually costs us more to verify in Thailand. But twenty-five dollars in the U.S. Um, is a lot cheaper than twenty-five dollars in Thailand. So, so we 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 thought a lot about what is the appropriate metric um, to uh, to adjust pricing on a, on a globalized basis. Anyway. Um, the bottom line, yeah, donations do tend to be higher than, than average. Uh, Working average rightwards, rates. sir, and then Roxy. Yeah. Yeah, any question? Uh, based on your revenue, we, you're talking about your technical teams and you have other teams, and, um, yeah. privacy teams, yes. and your safety teams, partly volunteer. But if you're a volunteer <coughs> contingent and kind of running a company in a semi, like the open source model where other people from outside the company contribute because <coughs> clearly you can't pay to everybody who's working. That's a great question. So Couchsurfing is a really unusual organization in a lot of ways. Um, one of the ways is we have we have approximately, uh, I think we have six or seven full-time employees, paid staff. We have about 1,500 volunteers um, who obviously do the vast majority of the actual work. Um, and is that developing for you and things like that as well? Everything. Um, we have volunteer programmers, we have volunteer customer service reps. We deal with a massive amount of uh, customer service inquiries and challenges. We have an entire PR team. Uh, no one on the PR team gets paid. Um, the safety team, there's only one paid person on the safety team. You know, um, So it, it, Couchsurfing is really a volunteer run and volunteer driven organization. And we're grateful you know, because our, our volunteers make it all possible. Without, without them, we, we couldn't uh, exist the way we do. Now, what's interesting is the process of uh, managing and motivating 1,500 volunteers on a global basis. Because, in effect, we have many of the challenges of a multinational corporation without the resources that a multinational corporation has. Um, and, and that exists on multiple levels. Uh, so, classify volunteers, you know, fanatics versus casual. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so. You know, you're dealing with cultural issues, you're dealing with language issues, you're dealing with um, people not having time uh, or saying they have time and then they don't. You know, basically all the volunteer issues that exist in any volunteer-driven organization <coughs> compounded by the multinational element. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also uh, our, our relative success at it has also been what has enabled Capture Thing to be as successful as it is because we have local feet on the ground um, in every city and town around the world. Um, and we also have a class of volunteer called ambassadors, which Jonathan mentioned earlier, and they are people with uh, special you know, powers or, or you know, special uh, authority from the organization, um, and, and they are evangelists for the community and the brand um, in, in every city around the world. It is interesting to compare uh, Wikipedia which some would draw a rough analogy to in the sense of people passionate about a project that has as its fuel good faith, uh, early on divided itself into different language versions. And the rules of Wikipedia vary by language version, mm -hmm. as do the administration and the volunteers. And here you're going for, I guess, a less federated system, still more of an ideal of couchsurfing that's the same in each place, yeah. even as it adjusts a little bit locally, like in the yeah. costs and such. Yeah. And I don't know, Mako, if it's fair to call on you, Benjamin Mako Hill, 
who's been deeply involved in uh, free software movement and politics and organization. I don't know, as you hear Dan's description, what sparks it sets off in your mind about how it might or might not compare to free software architectures and projects. I know you weren't prepared to be cold called, but I'm sure you'll <laughs> rise to the occasion. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, I mean, I think it, it raises, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot, there's a, there are a lot of interesting parallels, especially when it comes to uh, issues of sort of volunteer management and questions of the nature of the organization and sort of like uh, paid labor and how you're going to mix sort of paid labor and volunteer volunteer work. Um, so, I mean, I guess I guess the questions in in, in my mind are, are uh, uh, in particular ones sort of uh, how you do that. I mean, like when you. I mean, it sounds like you have you, you, you have you have resources, and one thing that I found in a lot of free software projects, and a lot of free software projects have found, is it's often easier to, to get money in terms of I mean, you can, even if it's just a matter of letting people donate, than it is finding necessarily ways to pay. Some of the paying people can, can introduce problems, and people become oh, that person getting paid why or die. And how do you sort of how do you sort of uh, uh, balance that? Um, and maybe I can respond to that. Right? Yeah, no, you're you're completely right. I mean, money is a big issue. It's very sensitive. Um, and that we deal with that with our with our volunteers. So one one of the things that we have thought a lot about, um, my partner Casey is is uh, thinks a lot about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, and how can we meet the needs the various needs of our volunteers um, in order in some ways in order to avoid um, just throwing cash around, um, which you know meets some needs, but frankly there are a lot of needs. You know you can be very wealthy and not have your needs met. Um, so, so some of the things that we've done to, to try to address that is um, Couchsurfing has two offices. One is stationary. Uh, we have headquarters in Berkeley, California. Um, and the other moves around the planet. Um, it's a nomadic office. And it's a live workspace. It's called a collective. Oh, there you go. Um, uh, it's a live workspace, and, um, and the idea, it, it's, a, it's very useful as a tool to help recruit volunteers because we do it in fun, exotic places. So we have an office in uh, Costa Rica right now. Um, we have an office for six months in, uh, in a village in Thailand. And what we do is we recruit volunteers we want, um, and then instead of uh, paying them lots of cash, we say, look, we'll pay for your room and board. Um, you know, come live with us for free, uh, do some work for couchsurfing, and have an adventure. Um, and, and a lot of people go for that. We've, we've uh, had really good experiences with that model. Um, and Mako, would you recommend that uh, at the top of the hierarchy there basically be a good beneficent decision maker whose judgment is essentially so, unquestioned? So that, I mean, that, that, that's an interesting question. I know that there, um, um, and, and I know that there are a few people who've, been, um, who've created other, basically other projects that, are, that look a lot like crowd surfing, um, but I don't know, they disagree about it. Some some fundamental aspects to do that, right? And this is something that's been an important. Um, it's it's an important uh, aspect of the free software community, both in terms of there have been a number of times when projects have you know forked for, for one reason or another, often often uh, successfully, probably more often unsuccessfully. But certainly, it's this this idea of the threat of the fork, as in this you know you can have the the part of the part of the, you can have a beneficent dictator beneficent dictator, but you also always have the, the opportunity. The surfers can always go elsewhere. You can always go elsewhere, right? And in some there case, could be a splinter community. So I mean, I, I don't I don't recall the names of these, but I I, I bookmarked them when I saw them. So there's like couch surfing splinter groups, as far as I can tell. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that and how that sort of impacts the nature of the organization. Um, Are there rump couches? <laughs> rump, rump couches. Settees. Right. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. So, so there have been, you know, we, we, we've, we've worked with thousands of volunteers over the years. Um, every now and then you, you get a group that, for whatever reason, doesn't like the way we do things. Um, and in, some, in, in a couple cases, a group of them have actually gone off and formed their own basically competitor to couch surfing, um, which they think, you know, represents what, what the true ideals of hospitality sharing should be. Um, none of them have, have gone very far. Um, especially those splinters. I mean, we do have other uh, competitors, so to speak, but but, um, but the splinters have never been very successful. So. And I don't know how easily or quickly you can do it, but how might the ideals differ? What's what's an ideal that could differ so much it would be worth splintering? Yeah, well, so you know, so one group of programmers felt very strongly that all of Couchsurfing's code should be open source. Um, That's the one that I know. 
<laughs> Coincidentally, it's the one that make of those. Yes. <laughs> do, do you know someone in the community? Or? I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, probably. Because I bookmarked it. The be welcome people, I bookmarked their things. So someone, yeah, someone said this. Yeah, problem. Yes. Got it. Um, um, that's right. She just got cruise around the top, Roxy? Yeah, um, just moving from the operations side, which I think is really fascinating to the user community itself. Uh, just for, for you, you can pick whichever one has been most interesting. I, I know when you register for a profile, there's an optional, what's your ethnicity box? And there's this great discussion that's like, go over here if you want to talk about ethnicity. And the real reason for keeping the box is to have conversations about ethnicity, right? Um, but that said, it, it, it also is probably part of a challenge dealing with ethnicity and gender and language barriers and all these sorts of demographic things about the user community. So just wondering if you could talk a little about those challenges and the, the growth of that over time. Sure. No, you're right. I mean, the, the ethnicity question has been, has, has fueled a lot of discussion, both um, internally within the management team and also, uh, you know, internally among, among the member base. Um, and they're like, well, you know, why does my ethnicity matter? You know, am I different? Am I better? You know, aren't we all humans? You know, that kind of thing, right? Um, so, you know, what, what we say is, um, first of all, Couchsurfing is about enabling, uh, about facilitating intercultural understanding. Um, and about enabling people to discover each other's differences and appreciate them. Um, not disrespect them for it, but actually to respect them for those differences. So, you know, so enabling people to uh, provide their um, ethnicity enables, enables them to signal how they self-identify. Um, or, you know, there's, there's no requirements on the ethnicity field. It's not a drop-down menu. It's a text box. Um, so, you know, some pe people are very creative. Some people will say uh, earthling, um, you know, or, or uh, you know, whatever, uh, ape descendant, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, pe people, or, or just leave a blank. People can answer it however they want. Um, and, and if it leads to a discussion about ethnicity and what makes us all similar or different, then we encourage that. You know, we welcome that kind of interaction because we feel like discussions like that ultimately bring people closer together, which is what Capture is all about. Do you have advice on this front, Roxy? No, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm interested in a slightly different, in, in the actual um, like growth of, of the user community. And, and when, um, I mean, we've been kind of like, oh, and it's a bigger problem for women to show up in other countries and travel. OK, but what's, what's that about? And, and how is, um, I mean, you guys now are an institution. And, and what, how have you seen the presence of yourselves as an institution Influence thought about that, um, or any of these other things about like, oh, well, this kind of people in this kind of country don't stay with them. Maybe that's changed over time. So, I'm sorry, are you asking that? I wonder if, if, if you've seen, as a result of couch surfing existing, um, <coughs> fostering these relationships, having this very positive, idealistic mission. Like, how do you have indicators on how you've influenced? Um, those relationships over time. Sure. So, um, so one of the really interesting things, you know, in, in the nonprofit uh, social enterprise world, um, one of the challenges is always uh, effective benchmarking and, and tracking success. You know, in the for-profit world, you can track it on, on a, an array of financial metrics. Um, in the nonprofit world, you're dealing with, you know, a, a third balance sheet or you know, other other ways to look at things. Um, so. It's actually one of the areas we want to do a better job of going forward. Um, we actually want to be able to do more quantification of the progress we've had and the impact that we've had and, and um, you know, understand the, the details of how it all works better. So that, that's a good question. Let's talk. OK. <laughs> the very patient gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, yes. Um, it's $25 uh, minimum for, to get fired away. Yeah. I was wondering if you knew what, like, the most generous donation that has ever been given by a single person? Track that kind of thing? Um, I haven't looked at numbers like that in a while. I mean, I think it's, I don't know, maybe $500 or so, okay. roughly. And one other thing, I was, when you were showing the revenue, um, it said both the outside merchandise has only had $680 worth. So I, I bought one of the t-shirts. So you tell me I own one of the only 30 t-shirts. <laughs> Makes you feel special, doesn't it? <laughs> so are you suggesting that he 
needs an audit of his numbers. I can't tell which. <laughs> but if, if you said you had bought more than 30 t-shirts, then that would be concerning. <laughs> um, no, so actually, we've just been talking about that recently. Um, we're actually going to do an overhaul of, of the e-commerce presence um, and update some of the merchandise and, and make it better. Bottom line, it, it, I, I think you're right. I think you do own a few t-shirts, which is awesome. And please tell your friends and have them buy more. But we, we actually don't get any, um, we sell that stuff at cost right now. Um, we don't get any margin from those sales. Um, so we've been thinking more about our e-commerce strategy and looking at, um, you know, selectively doing some strategic uh, pricing um, things to, to drive sales of some goods and, and uh, less so of others, but, but um, you know, use it as a profit center overall. Um, but overall, yeah, I mean, the sales of merchandise are, are pretty low today. How intrigued are you by the mobile space? The idea that I could just be wandering around Paris yeah. and just say, boom, show me couch surfers within 50 yards of me. I'm yeah. just at this bar. I would like to chat with somebody. Yeah, I like the mobile space. Um, we, we haven't done anything with it. Um, again, due to lack of resources, um, we've actually been approached by a couple of iPhone developers who have said, uh, hey, do you want me to do, create an iPhone app? And we're like, sure, go for it. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we don't really have anything good quite yet. But yeah, it'd be great. I mean, there's a lot of, huh? the other thing is, you know, if, if you arrive late at a, you know, your plane gets over, a train or whatever, you arrive at 11 p.m. at a train station in Frankfurt, you know, you don't know anyone. You don't have access to a laptop or a network or whatever. You know, if you can punch in someone and say, I need an emergency couch because um, I'm here at this train station. I mean, that's a useful thing. Um, so we like to have that. That's like the bat signal. You send back the, the, the couch <laughs> signal. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, to expand the um, uh, sort of functionality, uh, the term was for the, uh, let's see, the house swap. Well, or an earlier term is general vacation exchange. And there, in advance, we would check with other people listed. And there were subgroups, and I was part of the teachers' subgroups, etc. cetera. Um, and the other one um, is about use of schools. So there's lessons to be learned in terms of allowing for both ends. The mobile thing is like more of a media thing. And actually, there's a mix, because when I was uh, traveling, I would check with who was open for not just swapping, it wasn't swapping, it was if they were there in town, they might have a couch. So this has been going on for a while. And then usually they would meet with a trusted friend, you know, a person who's in a cafe, and they, they would use, you know, that hour or whatever and, and, and know whether or not they're trustworthy, but they previously have checked. And that um, uh, leads me to the school possibility. Has anybody allowed for the less uh, volatile or uh, well, having basically the, the lounge couches in the schools, you know, I mean, having a student uh, have this halfway thing, and sometimes schools allow for very small amount of dollars, but they, you have to be, you're only there for the sleeping time, and then you're there for the social time. So is there any that of, of that? The third thing has to do with security, which is pretty important, pretty recent. It was like last week in Harvard, excuse me, Harvard list, the Berkman list sent out, but it was at MIT. The next big thing, now that bank grab is hard, harder, is credit card fraud. And it is going to be fast, and the number of hours is only 12, what was called the last week, in terms of what action you can take. And yeah, a lot of people check their email, like, a lot of times, and they're paying for this alert SMS or whatever, in case there's unusual activity. But if it's only a $30 spread across a million customers, which, you know, machines can do, um, you know, it's, that is definitely the, the next mushrooming and very, very looming target. So having, relying on uh, your credit cards as verification, can you expand that perhaps to look for a little bit more mm, variety, like maybe affiliation, like... The, uh, the Level school. 10 on the, uh, well, <laughs> on the scale. A few yeah. years beforehand. Got yeah, it. Because Master Thank you. Open up. We've got it. Over to you. Um, so regarding school, I mean, ultimately Couchsurfing's mission, mission is to uh, connect people and facilitate intercultural understanding and so on. So, so we, you know, there is the possibility to target exchange programs, student exchange, things like that. Um, but uh, we, we target, you know, 18 and up um, for the most part. So, you know, that would probably be a college. Yeah, college, college and up. Um, so, you know, we're, we're open to working with schools. We haven't, we haven't done any... Uh, any special um, outreach to them, or have we built infrastructure around that? 
Um, credit card fraud is, is always a problem. Fortunately, we're mostly shielded from uh, some of that um, by, you know, based on our credit card uh, processing systems. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully it won't get too much worse. Now, of course, when you think about the legal interface uh, to this, it's one of these phenomena that's so difficult to classify. You were telling me before we started that you can't even get your 501c3 status ironed out as a federal U.S. nonprofit because the IRS just, you're not a church, <laughs> you're not a cult, you're not a scientific society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you might be a cult, actually. You might be a cult, yes. <laughs> that could help you, it turns out. Um, but uh, um, where was I going with all that? Oh, so. Uh, it's easy for phenomena like this to kind of fly below the radar. You're like the Segway, where they just don't know if you're on the sidewalk or on the, you know, what do you do? But there could be some tipping point where you can see the attorneys general worrying about some of the safety issues or kids, right. or you could see someone through the civil tort system threatening or saying, hey, I had a bad experience and I want some of your, <laughs> some of your balance sheet. Uh, have you encountered any of that? And I guess for those among us who are law students or legal academics, it's worth thinking about how some of the intermediary liability structures and cases we know of would treat a phenomenon like this. And I think, you know, without having to send a bill, the answer is unclear. Even after sending the bill, the answer would be unclear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, actually, that, that reminds me. Couchsurfing needs volunteer lawyers <laughs> and, and, and legal assistance in general. So even, even if you haven't passed the bar, but you could help prepare materials that our lawyer could sign off on, we would love to hear from you. Um, IP, patent, or yeah. tra trademark. Uh, um, well, right now, legal education kind of is in stealth mode. People write essay answers and exams, but it goes nowhere. It's just sort of like your stealth account. So actually having it matter could be a good uh, yeah, appeal. A Chris? So uh, I first used help surfing when visiting expensive countries. So I, purely out of financial need, right? Sure. Like I couldn't afford a hotel room and I hate sleeping in dormitories and hostels. Yeah. Um, and this Christmas when visiting Malaysia, I used help surfing for the first time actually in a, in a cheaper country where I can afford a hotel room. Yeah. Uh, and in that case, I didn't sleep on the person's couch, but I actually just went out and had dinner with them. And it was a really, really awesome experience. Um, but I found out there that like, there's an entire couch community where people don't sleep on it. I mean, people, they accept people from other countries to sleep on their sofas, but really, like the couch surfers in Kuala Lumpur, they get together every month or two and have beer and, and, and chat over dinner. And I'm wondering if you can talk about sort of the growth of this as just purely like a way for people to find other like-minded individuals. Well, this gets back to the broader definition. Who live in their doing. town. Yeah. Right? They, like, it's, it's just a, a, another form of a meetup group. Yeah. So, so couchsurfing um, has, has transformed into a thriving social community, even in the, to some extent independent of actual travel. Um, in New York, they have a weekly meeting of New York couchsurfers um, that attracts, I've heard, approximately 80 people every single week. And, and you know, it's not about travel. It's just hanging out, having beers, and you know, meeting other, as you say, like-minded people. So yeah, I mean, if there are um, thriving social community everywhere. Uh, we had a party a couple weeks ago in San Francisco celebrating a million members. Um, we had about 300 people show up. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, it goes from online to offline. Um, and it's sure. kind of an interesting phenomenon where you don't know that your identity is that of a couch surfer until you've done it. It's not an independent identity so much. Or until you buy a t-shirt. Yeah, until you buy the t-shirt, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, couch but, surfing meet up every Wednesday night in Boston, too. Yeah, so Wednesday night. Night. Wednesday night. Where is it? Uh, I'm not sure. I can't make it. At the other side cafe on, on uh, Newberry Street. Awesome. Elijah will visit. He's the first couch hey. surfer, really, if you think about it. <laughs> I'd love to go. It's a Jewish holiday. Uh, yeah. to my Passover. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would come otherwise. But, uh... but it does feel like it's one of these things where, just as uh, the Obama campaign, much to its advantage, got people to use their cell phones during the rally to dial the number of one person and make that pitch. And once you've done it, suddenly. Now you are part of the campaign. It's easier to make the next 15. Here, I imagine, once you've done that first experience and get the good feedback, you're like, hey, I am a couch surfer. I'm going to go to the meetup, et cetera, et cetera. Robin. So this question of how to keep like-minded people together as you grow, it is an interesting question. And what are, how are you doing that? So the way I see it is one of couch surfing's greatest assets is our volunteer network of 50, roughly 1,500 ambassadors around the world. These are people who have actually applied to work for free for couch surfing. Um, they are 
you know, hardcore um, evangelists of how they really believe in, in the institution. Um, so I see, I believe that they have a very important role in evangelizing locally and bring, recruiting the right people and kind of keeping the wrong people out. Um, so I mean, you know, they're, they're always, it's always possible to sign but Once you got to the website, whichever way you got there, mm -hmm. how, is there any formal mechanism? Or it's just like these aren't people like you, so The couch like, surfing like, oath or quiz. I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, Craigslist, that was the initial idea, and now, of course, murderers are on Craigslist. But you know how, I just wonder if you had come up with a scheme I hadn't perceived to. No, I mean, you know, what's tempting is to put everyone through a training course. And, yeah. Um, and, and then sign here. Yeah, and, and we're doing that with ambassadors. <laughs> Um, but with ordinary members, you know, we, we also have, our, you know, again, of, of our 1,500 volunteers, everyone, hopefully, everyone here who's a couch surfer received a welcome email. Did you guys receive a welcome email from someone? Okay. Yes, so, your profile. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so, so the idea is that, that everyone gets a welcome email that is so, supposed to kind of set the tone for the culture. And you can always disregard it. You know, you can always say, you know, I know that's how it is, and I don't care. Um, I'm just going to use the system for my own good. And do you have? Is there any? Stop asking questions. No, no, do you have, is there any mechanism by which people can unbecome a couch surfer? You you can delete your own account. Yeah. And but think of all the things I sign up for online. You know, you sign up for it, and then they're intuitive. So I I do think you're doing a fabulous job, and you've got a million members. But what? percent of that membership do you think is still happy and eager to be a couch surfer rather than um, So we, we've run periodic kind of customer surveys, um, which have come back overwhelmingly positive. If, if you consider something like a net promoter score, um, we score very well on that. Um, of course, there are... Just not response. Yeah, but no, but I mean, we can also track that, right? I mean, we, we had a survey pop up as soon as someone logs in um, with just like three or four questions. Uh, so, yeah. No, I mean, it, so one question would be the degree of churn, how many people you lose right. on the one end as you're getting people. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have a, um, I, don't, I don't know the numbers offhand, but a large percent of our members are, are active members by our definition, um, over half uh, logged in within the last three months. That would be good. So. And I suppose, too, a crucial part of the strategy could be keeping it low profile and low key, not advertising, not drawing people in until they discover it. Yeah, well, it, it's an interesting balance because on the one hand, we want to grow. We want more people because that enables us to achieve our mission of facilitating intercultural understanding and relationships and so on. On the other hand, we don't want to grow too much, especially if it's the wrong kind of people. So it's not bodies for the sake of bodies. It's, you know, right-minded bodies. Just say it, Rossi. Just scroll it so I can see ages. Oh, you just wanted to see ages. I, I couldn't tell if, yeah, something. No, you have to scroll, scroll to the right. Sorry, oh, to the right. That's why you kept. Too weird. Got it. Sorry. That's, yeah, that's it. Everybody was leaning that way. <laughs> what is going on? So um, how are we on time, MR? We have to go because there's classes uh, shifting around. So there's some class surfing uh, about to happen. Um, so this has been a fabulous hour. Um, uh, it's such an just amazing phenomenon, a really interesting one, one that no doubt will face a share of challenges precisely because of its success, including some of the cultural issues that are in flux right now that uh, have occupied us for the last few minutes of conversation. Certainly, if I were your parents and hearing this and knowing your success, I'd be beaming in the corner of the room. Oh, wait a minute. There are your parents beaming in the corner of the room. Um, but we're, we're so pleased you had a chance to stop in and chat with us and uh, really share this with us. We are proud of you, too. Thank you very much.